Well, on that note, let's get started. <laughs> Welcome to Week to Week, the political roundtable from the Commonwealth Club of California from Monday, August 7th, 2017. Oh, the perils of sudden fame. Not since Icarus flew too high to the sun has someone had such a spectacular career flame out as White House Communications Director Anthony Scaramucci. <laughs> oh, come on. He held his position for all of 10 days wow. before he was fired by the new chief of staff. So to put that into perspective, uh, General Mike Flynn, you'll recall, he served more than twice as long as Trump's short-lived national wow. security advisor. Uh, it takes longer to celebrate the 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> the Stern Grove Festival lasts longer. And Donald Trump will be on vacation for longer than Scaramucci served in his administration. <laughs> So let's move on while I still have a career. Uh, I'm John Zepperer, your host for Week to Week and the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial. I'm very honored to be here with this great panel and with all of you. On today's program, we're going to discuss the economy, immigration, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, uh, the next steps for Arnold Schwarzenegger and Colin Kaepernick, not together, Colin, <laughs> and other political news. And of course, we'll end the evening with our live news quiz. I always note that the Commonwealth Club, of course, has people with a wide range of views, so any opinions expressed up here, no matter how much you love them, are not necessarily those of the Commonwealth Club. Um, I do have one other uh, little notice that I want to share with all of you politically-minded people. On October 10th, in our new building, I will have the pleasure of interviewing conservative Trump critic Charlie Sykes. He has a new book coming out called How the Right Lost Its Mind. So get your tickets, it's going to be a great program. Now let's meet our panelists for today. I'm going to start on the far end of the stage there with Bob Butler. He's a reporter for KCBS Radio. You can follow him on Twitter at BobButler7. So welcome, Bob. <laughs> Next to him is Chuck Nevius, C.W. Nevius. He's a columnist with the Santa Rosa Press Democrat and, of course, a longtime former uh, columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. And he's on Twitter at C.W. Nevius. <laughs> Next to me is Doug Sovereign. He's a political and investigative reporter also for KCBS Radio. He's on Twitter at Sovereign Nation, and we have to note that Doug is being inducted into the Bay Area Radio Whoa. Hall of Fame, so congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> there are question cards throughout the room. I think you all know how we do this, so write down some questions. We'll have someone collect them and bring them up to me, and I will try to ans ask excuse me, as many as possible. So on to our program. Um, in the 1992 presidential election, we all remember the, the admonition that uh, Bill Clinton had up on the, the campaign wall. It was, you know, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, you know, focus on the economy. That's what makes people vote. That's what's going to either win or lose this election for you. So we're a quarter century later. Let's talk about the current state of the U.S. economy and what it means on the political scene. We have the latest job numbers, which remain strong. The stock market keeps hitting new highs. On the other hand, nationwide, there's, I think, no other term for it than a crisis in, among retailers. Um, and wages are still largely stagnant for many people. So let's start on the end there with Bob. I mean, Bob, how is the economy doing, and, and who gets blame or credit for it? I wish I could figure that out, because <laughs> I make a lot of money. Uh, the one yeah. thing I will talk about, the retailers, um, my wife uh, spent uh, years working for The Gap mm -hmm. in the men's warehouse, and, you know, the Internet has really killed, um, you know, big box stores, the, the, the malls, the, the brick-and-mortar stores, because I, before I came today, I, my door, uh, my, somebody knocked on my door. It was delivery, a couple of boxes. My wife orders all this stuff online. People order their stuff online, and for the, for the companies, it's actually cheaper to pay for the stuff to be returned and shipped out again if it's the wrong size than it would be to have an actual brick and mortar store. And that really kind of makes sense. Yeah, um, at, as Chuck knows from the newspaper world, newspapers large and small are really feeling the pain from you know, the loss of all these at retail advertisers. And uh, you know, as if newspapers have had it so good for the past decade. It's been great so far. I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, Chuck, what's your take on the economy? Actually, let me get to, how does the economy feel? Because that can sometimes, if we're talking about politics, that can be even more important than the stats that are issued by the Labor Department. Well, exactly, and I want to address that, but I wanted to get a Sakamochi uh, joke in. One of my Twitter followers said, I've been on, Com I've been on Comcast hold that long, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the economy is, a, 
these are a group of carnivores, and their sense is the more you let us do, the more we're going to like it. And I think they're getting a message from Trump that uh, regulations are fewer, we're not going to be all over you with oversight, and things are raging, and that's, and that's the way it should go. However, the other day I ordered shoestrings online. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what, when did this begin to happen, that that's how I need shoestrings? Oh, I'll just get online and just, you know, and they are sent to my house. It was a terrific thing. The number of stores in downtown San Francisco, the mm -hmm. storefronts that are closing, I mean, we're in a very different situation with retail. And I, I don't know where it's going to, if it's going to be drones from Amazon or what it's going to be, but we've got uh, a real concern there. I now, think how many of you have been, have been on Union Street in, in the past month or two? I mean... Lots of open spots. Mm -hmm. It's not the raging city. Right stadium. here at Union Square. I mean, yeah. if you walk around, you, you, you see it all the time. So I think that's going to be an issue, an upcoming issue. And it's, and it's important that um, jobs, what are these jobs? They're not great jobs, but mm -hmm. it's all working through. But I think throughout this entire, gee, it's been already 200 days of Donald Trump, mm -hmm. so it's been forever. But throughout this entire oh. time, you know, I, I keep getting the sense that we're, we're still trying to do the right thing. And I think we're still leaving some of these people behind because the jobs that they're getting are not the kinds of jobs that the middle class used to see. And it, it it's, remains to be a problem. Doug, your take? Well, a couple of things. First of all, when the economy, the economy is doing pretty much now what it was doing under President Obama, essentially the same. Stock market is hitting highs, jobs are being created, unemployment's going down, and really, the market is up about 10% so far this year. It was up 12% the last six months of last year, which means it did slightly better in the last six months of President Obama than it's done under Trump. You won't hear about that from President Trump. That's fake news, come on. He, would, he wouldn't give, he didn't give Barack Obama any credit for the economy doing well, relatively well, and he's called them phony numbers, cooked books, fake news. As soon as he became president, suddenly these numbers are gospel. Sure. Um, but as you said, wages are stagnant, growth is a little bit better this year. It feels like things are accelerating a little bit, but in income inequality hasn't changed in the last eight months. Uh, wages haven't gone up much. Unemployment went from a high of 10% under Obama to 4.8%. Under Trump, it's come down to 4.3%. That's a nominal improvement. So things are just sort of continuing the way they were. How much credit does Trump get? He's going to take as much as he, as he can. He'll take it all. Yeah, he'll, he'll he take will. it all. Yeah. And, you know, the only place I would say you can give him a little bit of credit is that in the promises he makes of the policies he wants to implement, mm -hmm. um, spending on infrastructure, deregulation, which he started to do a little bit, cutting taxes, those are things that are attractive to corporations and investors. So people are going to feel like there are better times ahead, so they'll buy stocks, so the stock goes up. Uh, if those promises aren't ultimately kept, he hasn't, they haven't passed an infrastructure bill, they haven't passed a tax cut, uh, then the very things that are making people optimistic and helping the economy move a little bit better are going to come back to haunt him. So uh, until he makes good on those promises, you know, he, I don't know how much credit he can really take, but, but I think at, at, at the ground level, the same, the people who were suffering eight months ago still are. And the, the rich are is, getting richer and everybody else is sort of in the middle. Yeah, the irony is, is that you, a lot of these employers say they can't find employees. Right. They say that I've got to, I've got to get you. people from overseas, including our president, to work at my, at my yeah. resort because Americans don't want these jobs. And the, we, 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 we bash illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants all the time, but they're willing to do those bad, how many of you have wanted to go out and pick, pick fruit? You know, every, if you, anybody, how, who's ever picked fruit off a tree? Yeah, Got yeah? Ones. It's not easy, is it? I go, I love cherries, and I'll go out there to pick some cherries, and I'm out there like, you know, it's, it's, it's not the kind of work that a lot of our folks, especially our millennials, want to do. So there is a problem in the labor force and that it is limited to where they can find people, but, if they were willing to pay them a living wage, you know, and share some of the wealth that's going all the way to the top, I bet you they would have no trouble finding people Isn't to work. Is there an app that picks the cherries for you? I, I, would, <laughs> no. I would think there should be. And, and delivers them by drone, I'm sure. Yeah, drone, there you go, there you go. I mean, I, I, the, the question, I mean, kind of that John is asking is, if things are going so well, why aren't we happy? Right. You know, if the economy's doing all these things, and the stock market's going up, and it, it comes back to a divided and divisive country, and that it's just such a difficult thing to see. I have never followed politics like this. I mm -hmm. have never so often checked Twitter and Politico, and I have never, you know, a flipboard. I'm on it all the time, and I, I, I just, it, part of it is my sense of outrage, and part of it is my sense of what are we going to do, but we keep getting these great economic reports, and that seems to be the engine of 
any successful country, and yet we're still divided and unhappy. You know, there's a political theory, I shouldn't call it a rule, that if you're president, you, it, good chance you're gonna have a recession at some point mm -hmm. while you're in office. You want it to be at the beginning of your time. You know, Bill Clinton had that, why? Because you're still in some sort of a honeymoon, uh, you know, with Congress and the media, you hope that'll help carry you through. You get to offer solutions to something that is cyclical anyway, and you'll, you'll grow out of it. Um, and uh, then by the time the upswing comes, you either have good midterms or you get reelected or both, you know. Whereas if you have, you can come in and, you know, be Jimmy Carter and have things actually kind of stabilizing when you're there, then the recession hits when you're up for reelection and then you're really in trouble. Um, if you were Donald Trump right now, any president, by the way, is going to take credit for the economy, no yeah. matter what, right. if it's good, right. and if it's bad, it's the previous guy's fault. Right. But uh, if you're Donald well, you Trump... I never heard Obama say uh, that about, about Bush. Well, he didn't have to blame things on Bush because it was obvious what, <laughs> what he was inheriting. He had a crisis situation he had to address immediately. So I, I don't... It was taken for granted by the country where only 27% of the people liked Bush. That I, I don't think... You know, Obama was a gracious enough man not to have to do that, I think, but... Trump is another story. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think, uh, I mean, we've had now 17 million uh, jobs created since the depth of the uh, Great Recession. And uh, we've had, you know, years of, of growth or recovery. Um, we're kind of due. We're At overdue. At some point, I mean, it's, yeah, overdue. We're due. I mean, all the economists will say it. And um, I was just reading a report yesterday, in fact. Uh, that warns, oh, let's not get too excited, could be a bubble, there were, caution, caution. There's no sign of it right now to me. I mean, things are accelerating at the moment. Growth is, is accelerating, the market's hitting these highs. But at some point, you have to think, you know, real estate prices continue to set records. Yeah, it is cyclical, and we are due. I mean, we've had the, a very long expansion, but we were at a real low point, so we get to have a longer bull market, a longer run-up since it. But, yeah, I mean, in a year or two or three, we all, everyone assumes there will be a, some sort of downturn, and... How, when it hits for Trump, we'll see how he handles it, if he's still president then. Um, someone uh, in the audience writes, in uh, West Virginia is that, uh, employers cannot find workers who can pass drug tests. Mm. <clears throat> Are they yeah. filling for opioids or something else? Well, well it's both, probably. Yeah, yeah it might yeah. be. Well, we have to change drug tests. I mean, uh, <laughs> I would say that the uh, American people, I mean, if it's opioids, it's yeah. a difficult and terrible thing. But I would say, for example, recreational marijuana is on its way. And um, next to acceptance of LBGT citizens, I would say the acceptance of legalization of marijuana is one of the fastest turnarounds I've seen since I've been alive. It's amazing. Uh, mm. So we may have to do that. We may have to say, okay, you have a few drinks at night, maybe you smoke pot at night. Those are probably, doesn't, don't disqualify you as, a, as an employee. Someone else in a different handwriting, so I'm assuming it's not the same person. <laughs> Why are we not making solar panels in coal country? Well, it's not because they can't pass the drug tests. Um, <laughs> I mean, the companies that are in the solar are tend to Well, the, the coal-powered right? solar panels are coming. That's just a matter of time when we get those ready to go. But. <laughs> well, that's what's how You know, look, look at Pittsburgh, a steel town, which yeah. uh, is now a center of green tech, and they're all about solar. And contrary to what when the president said, I was elected to represent the people of Pittsburgh, not Paris. And then you heard from the people from Pittsburgh saying, we didn't vote for you. We voted <laughs> for you. Uh, they've totally turned themselves around, and I guess he's behind on what their image is. But it happens. West Virginia is a different story. But... Uh, it, it, uh, they are clinging to it there, and maybe their workforce hasn't been as adaptable because they're too busy smoking pot at night, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but Why are you pointing at me, Doug? <laughs> He's retired now. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's not going to pass anymore. Um, well, let's move on to re a related topic, and, that it, and we kind of touched on it. That is immigration. Uh, you recall President Trump recently endorsed a House of Representatives GOP plan that would cut legal immigration by about half within a decade. Um, hopeful immigrants would, have, would move to a merit-based system where you earn points based on your age, your, your skills, and your wealth. Um, Florida Senator Marco Rubio said the bill wouldn't have enough votes to pass the Senate. But uh, Doug, what's, I mean, this is, 
other countries that already do this. I mean, Canada, Canada Australia, does it. Uh, New Zealand does it. Yeah. Um, it's not the way America has always done it. No, and there was a lot of outrage and uproar about what happened to give us your huddled masses, you know, yearning to be free. Oh, what happened to our yeah. excluding Chinese for right. a long time? Uh, as Diane Feinstein tweeted the day the president uh, endorsed this uh, last week or the week before, I think it was last week. Um, she said, hey, my grandmother came here from Russia and didn't speak English and would not be admitted under this plan. And I tweeted the, my grandparents as well, and some might argue the country would be better off without any sovereigns in it, but <laughs> I happen to think it's good that we're here. Uh, and it's we're true. There, there are a whole, thank you, whole, you know, the, the tradition in America has always been family sends for family. I mean, my grandfather came on the Lusitania before it was torpedoed. Thank you. Um, fortunately, not that voice. That's the time to be on it. Yeah, in 1911, and left his wife and five children behind in Russia. And it took 10 years before he made enough money or decided he, you know, had enough beers and was ready to have company. Uh, <laughs> it took him 10 years before he could send for his. And there was a world war in the intervening years, but before he could send for his wife and kids to come. And under this plan, they wouldn't be able to come. So it's a very different approach from what the um, U.S. has always stood for. I just, I just feel like, um, I think I understood the term dog whistle, but I didn't really understand it as well until we saw this. And this is like one thing after another thing after another thing that is just going to the base. We've got to limit immigration. We've got to get the, the transgender people out of the military. Who asked for that? Not the Pentagon, not the military. And more than anything, it sounds like he threw that out there just to, you know, it's a dog whistle. All of a sudden, the dog's looking over here. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't followed up on that at all. Immigration is a great example. Next, we're going to do uh, affirmative action, why, it's, why we're discriminating against white people. In the universe. You know, yeah. I mean, it, we're just going down the list of these things. And I remember, I don't know why I remember this so well, but Michelle Bachman, you remember her. She was a Tea Party member. And then she left, she left politics for some reason. I don't know. She just resigned. And after she'd left, um, she said something. And reporters went to Nancy Pelosi, and they said, did you hear what Michelle Bachman said? And she said, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're at that point with, with these Trump tweets and so forth. I mean, I, there was a Vanity Fair story today that said uh, Republicans just starting to push back against Trump. And I'm thinking, is that the 10th or 12th time I've read this? I mean, I keep mm -hmm. hearing it. Gonna, right. But they really are. I mean, for Chuck Grassley to say, you're going to fire Sessions? Well. I don't think we have time for a hearing on a new attorney general. So just so you know, it's not going to happen. For Orrin Hatch, Orrin Hatch defends, defends the transgender community in the military? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> come on. I mean, they say politics makes strange bedfellows. Uh, well, there are a lot of strange That's, that's taking strange it even farther going than I thought it was going to. You talk about, you talk about the REACH program. I think it's called the REACH program, the, the uh, immigration program. Mm -hmm. So coming over here on right. BART, you know, I said they have a, actually a little test that you can see if you would qualify. And you have to have, I think, 30 points. And you get 25 points if you win a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> okay? So we'll take if you are, If you have an income less than $50,000, you get no points. Mm. If you are over 50, you get no points. Um, there are, um, <laughs> oh, that's oh, that's right. The gold, gold medal. Yeah, that's right. So these these are all unreal. I mean, if, this is all unrealistic. I mean, mm. I got 23 points out of 30. Okay, there's no wow. way I want to come. I can come in. I imagine many of you in here. Uh, oh, do you speak English? Well, I got points for that. <laughs> um, but many of people in this country would not be able to would not be able to, wouldn't be qualified to be admitted. And it reminds me of people who become U.S. citizens. Right. Um, Barb Bloom, when she took her citizenship mm -hmm. test, you know, she knew things about our Constitution that we had all forgotten. And the new, the new immigrants, the new citizens, actually make really good Americans because they know the law. You know, the gold star dad up there <laughs> who pulled out his Constitution said, read this, I'll, you can right. borrow mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it really is heartbreaking that we've gotten so cold-hearted mm -hmm. and hard-hearted that we have to take out our frustration that, well, my, my lot in life is bad. It's got to be these people's fault. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's now turning into policy in Washington. 
Barbara, I just want to mention, so I recently had the honor of uh, welcoming the new citizens. They swore in a thousand of them in Oakland, and I got to give the welcoming speech, which was really a moving and wonderful experience. And I mentioned that, Bob, uh, he mentioned Barb Bloom, who's someone who used to work in our newsroom, who was from Canada and had lived here for years and finally got her citizenship. And she brought in the test she had to take, and no one in the newsroom could pass it. <laughs> and it was harder then, and that you had to pass more. Now you only have to pass six out of 10. But I mentioned that. I mean, most Americans can't, I mean, could our president, well, by now he could probably name all three branches of government, but, <laughs> but I mean, simple questions like that. How many amendments are to the Constitution? I'm not sure everybody knows the answer to that. So uh, you're right, and things that we take for granted are precious to them. Uh, but I do think he's being advised that um, he needs to keep motivating, s stoking the base, and keeping that 35% or so in his corner. And they're there. I mean, I don't think very many have abandoned him. It takes more than that to win, but he's getting this political advice that you gotta keep these people with you before, or they'll, they might start to slip away and then he'll work from there. But if, you, but if you look at his base, so basically half of the registered voters voted, right? And he got, what was it, uh, 40, 47 46 percent of those registered voters? Mm -hmm. So he got basically 25% of the country mm -hmm. that voted for him. Right. It's just that they voted in the right places for exactly. him to, to win the, the Electoral College. So I keep hearing stories on, on the cable networks about you know, stoking his base. His base is a quarter of the country. Mm -hmm. And I think we spend way too much time talking about him you know, blowing dog whistles at his base. The media needs to take a lot more responsibility in pointing out what's right and what's wrong. And, and you know, I... I listened to Rush this morning. I, I got to know what the other side's thinking. You know, you really, really have to understand. Well, you just revealed which side you're on. Huh? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it really is interesting when you listen and you hear the absolute BS and the outrage over trivial things mm -hmm. that just, this is, and these are the people that support Trump. And they'll tell you in a heartbeat that, you know, this Russia thing, is, it's, it's all made up by the Fake media. News. Trump's done a great job mm -hmm. of marginalizing this investigation. It's gonna be really be interesting to see what happens when, if Mueller comes back and says, and starts handing out indictments. That's mm -hmm. gonna be really interesting. Well, and right. we'll get to that in a little bit. All right. Uh, two more things to tie into the immigration thing, though. Someone in the audience says, the New York Times today wrote a scathing editorial against the uh, new uh, immigration bill from Senators Cotton and Purdue. Um, but then they ask, but why shouldn't the world's third most populous nation take action to stabilize population growth? Um, I think we are. I think we are stabilizing population growth. I mean, things are so, this is how serious it is in, in my world. The other day I agreed with Bill Crystal. So mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a sad day in my life. <laughs> Were but you what, smoking pot at the time? Not at the time, not okay. exactly at the time. Delivered but, by drone. Yeah. Yeah. Delivered by drone, it was edibles. Um, <laughs> The, uh, what he said was, this is like a stress test for the American Constitution, because we've got a, you know, a person who's erratic, who's out of control, he, he said, and yet, the institutions, the three branches of government, those things have performed well. And every once in a while, we like to clunker, and this was one. Mm -hmm. But it's actually working out pretty well. We have to fight back to these things. We've energized a ton of people. That's, that's a great thing. I'm a little concerned about the flood of gold medalists coming into the United States, though. <laughs> other, other than, you know, I think in a lot of ways, for all of his bluster, I think, we're, I think we're actually doing relatively well in a very difficult situation. We'll have the curling gold medalist here next. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, big business has favored larger immigration numbers, mm -hmm. helps to keep down wage pressure for some of the same reasons. Uh, organized labor has often had a more skeptical or even opposing view about it. I mean, do those traditional positions still stand today, you think? Bob's our labor expert, so I'll let him <laughs> on that. Well, I mean, when it comes to this immigration law, I, I'm a member, Doug and I are members of SAG-AFTRA. You've heard of the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, it's now merged with the, the um, broadcasters union. Uh, we had, it's SAG-AFTRA. It does not take a position on the immigration issue, but we are very, very, you know, anxiously trying to organize um, Telemundo and Univision mm -hmm. because those are folks who really get the short end of the stick. Telemundo is owned by NBC, but you can have newspaper uh, reporters working in the same newsroom for NBC making, you know, 
10, 20, 30, 40 percent more than the Telemundo people in the same newsroom. So that's something that I think is important. I can't really speak on whether or not organized labor um, wants more immigration. Mm. You can't. Okay. Well, um, my summer gift to you has been that, again, we did not start the program talking about Donald Trump. <laughs> But we're now at that point. Um, we got there on our own. Yes. You started us with Scaramucci. Come on. <laughs> I can't pass up a Scaramucci story. Yeah. Um, so President know. Trump, did you see he's, he's disseminating uh, what he's calling real news videos mm -hmm. on, on Facebook and such. The editor of conservative magazine Commentary said, quote, you really have to want to be fooled if you watch this news, unquote. Um, <laughs> But of course, most people will be watching it with liquor. Um, but let's get into all things Trump. As usual, there's a lot to discuss. And, and let's start with kind of the, the ch changing uh, staff at the White House. Um, I noticed an in interesting dissonance on the website from ABC News recently. The main story was a picture of President Trump meeting with his aides. And the headline was, Trump denies there is White House chaos. Literally directly above that photo was a breaking news banner about Anthony Scaramucci being booted out of the you know out of office after just ten days, um, and of course you'll recall Sean Spicer had quit as White House spokesperson uh, because Scaramucci was hired. Um, Doug, do you think <laughs> new Chief of Staff John Kelly is going to end well, the chaos? Or let's it, see. It's say? been a week, and today the president went on a tweet storm. So it does seem, uh, there weren't any major leaks in the last few days of the White House, so Kelly seems to have imposed some military discipline and cracked the whip a little bit, except on his commander in chief, over whom he really has no control. So this morning, the president was back to his usual Twitter self, so the, the, the restraint didn't last long there. Uh, we'll see, I mean, Kelly apparently came in and said, you know, my way or the highway, and that Scaramucci was gone. You know, I, I heard that today that Scaramucci is negotiating for a miniseries deal on his 10 days at the White House. And I don't know if it'll be a 10-part series and one day it'll be each hour, uh, I don't know. But somehow he's, he thinks he can get a movie or a miniseries. And I feel like 24 and they get like 10 exactly. years out of this yeah. thing. Uh, pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, apparently, at least in the short term, it appears that Kelly has you know, tightened the ship a little bit and is gonna run it with uh, you know, some sort of military precision. Now, Barbara Lee, Congresswoman from Oakland, uh, believes that John Kelly is an extremist and is going to militarize the White House. And she's quite upset, actually, with what's happening. But, you know, you know, as you mentioned, Spicer quit because he hired Scaramucci. Scaramucci won the power struggle with Priebus, so he was out. So then he hires Kelly to replace Priebus, who forces Scaramucci out. So this all goes back to bring, you know, Priebus would still be there if not for hiring Scaramucci. And the chaos has subsided a little bit for a couple of days. But uh, there's no reason to think long term, in my opinion, that we've seen the last of, of the upheaval in the White House. Um, Chuck, your well, thoughts on the, the Kelly era? Well, <laughs> the sense that I, I think what people are saying is that they can't, he figures he can't control the tweets. The tweets, we can, we can tone them down if we can, but, but let's at least control the chaos in the office. Mm -hmm. you know, he's interrupting people when they're going on and on and on. He's saying you have to make an appointment, and that means you, Jared, you're gonna have to, Ivanka, you're gonna have to make an appointment to come and see him. You can't just wander in, and we're gonna give you better information. Right. Mm -hmm. There was that ad on Fox about people who could get lifetime insurance for $12, <laughs> and he tweeted it. He said, you know, I don't know what the big deal is insurance. We, we, you can get medical insurance for $12, and they were like, no, that's not really true. He said it in the interview with the New York Times. He said, people, they pay a dollar a month, they get these great plans. Like, What's wrong with that? It sounds great, yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think some of that could possibly happen. But, you know, I watched Kellyanne Con I hate myself for doing it. I watched Kellyanne Conway on the Sunday show, and I'm storming around the living room, you know. That it, the idea is if we say it often enough, people will believe it. She mm -hmm. said... Donald Trump is not the focus of a Russian investigation. You know, James Comey said that to him three times. And Comey said, no, I didn't. And he said, yeah, you did. And now Kellyanne Conway is going to say it again. If you just keep repeating it, I mean, that's about as cynical a view of the American people as you're going to find. And I just cannot believe that's not going to catch up with him. But it hasn't caught up to him yet. I know. And I'm aware of that. We, we, I would have thought it would have caught up to him during the campaign mm -hmm. because I got tired of watching... We shouldn't really say names, should we? Um, 
Well, we already know you're listening to Rush Limbaugh. He watches <laughs> Kellyanne Conway. <laughs> Doug probably subscribes to. I guess my all time. I only watch Game of Thrones. Yeah. I don't watch him. My, I guess Remarkably my, my all time right? head scratcher is, is, is Jeffrey Lord, um, who yeah. last week um, was on defend. He was on CNN defending something else the president had done. And everybody on the panel was like, was like pulling their hair out. And one guy said, is there anything he could do oh. that you would criticize? Um, and that's really what it boils down to is that, you know, there are people, his, you know, spokes, his mouthpieces, his, his surrogates, this, his, his base, there's nothing he could do that will turn them against him because they're so, I guess, so desperate for what he is selling. But even when he sells them a bill of goods, it's like they don't care. And I, I saw a headline today. So what if he's guilty of corruption? Would you care if he's guilty of obstruction? Mm -hmm. Would you care? And that's really what it's boiled down to now is that those folks don't care. You talked about the, the, the Trump News Network now. Yeah. Kaylee McEnany. Yeah. It's another one that's on my list. It's like I, they, they have mastered the art of projection. Okay, and this is a, a conservative thing that goes way back. You know, remember when, when um, Sarah Palin was announced as the nominee of uh, the vice presidential uh, candidate? Um, and it turned out that her daughter was pregnant mm -hmm. out of wedlock, the family values candidate. So I remember hearing somebody talk about the left is bringing this up, they're attacking the family. But nobody has said anything. They're, they're master of getting the first punch in and putting you on the defense. And that's what's been happening this entire campaign, the entire presidency. And I don't know if the media is ever going to recover because they had a great time covering him. I know the head of one of the networks said he may be bad for the country, but he's great for business. Mm -hmm. CBS. And, and, CBS, yeah. I, 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 Kaylee McEnany, your, your friend Kaylee McEnany, who many of you probably have seen on CNN, she's a frequent Trump surrogate. She has a new job. She is the new, as of today, hired as the new spokesperson for the Republican National Committee. A job that Sean Spicer used to have. So you're going to see her more, but in a different capacity. She won't be on a panel. She'll be a, one of the guests. But, you know, Trump himself said, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and people would still vote for me. And it's still true. I mean, there was a poll about three weeks ago asking that question. If he shot someone on Fifth Avenue, would he still support him? And most of his people still say they would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they would I, figure the person had it coming. I'll give you a quick thing, then we can go to the next talk. But I, I, I talked to someone who actually is one of the aides to Dianne Feinstein. And I said, oh, my God, I can't believe this whole Trump thing. And you know, I said, I don't think people are afraid of Trump anymore because he tried to bully him and nothing really happens. And he says, well, you know, that's all true. What I would say, and this was two months ago, is spend 10% of your time on the tweets and 90% of your time on health care and see where that gets you. And it turns out health care is going to be a much bigger deal mm -hmm. than some really obnoxious tweets. And now it's going to be tax reform. Uh, sticking with the staff just for a little bit, uh, the rumor this week is that Scaramucci's old job as communications director at the White House uh, could go to Trump advisor Stephen Miller. Oh, God. You, remember, you know him? You've seen him on... Uh, yeah. I've dealt with him in person, and it's not pleasant. Is, he's not as charming as he was on uh, oh. fighting with the CNN... Uh, Do you remember the, the movie Animal House? There was the guy, I think his name was Niedermeyer? Yeah. He's like Niedermeyer. That's who he reminded me of when I first met him. Well, there was a guy like that in everybody's high school, wasn't yep. there? That, was that, that guy was there. There's a speech that surfaced that he gave in high school where he said, I don't see why I have to pick my stuff up at the cafeteria. That's why we have janitors. Right. Mm -hmm. They need the job. They, yeah, they, they probably need, need the, the job, job after yeah. all. What, what did you think about it when he accused in that, that uh, White House briefing, Jim he Acosta. accused CNN reporter Jim Acosta of right. cosmopolitan bias. He didn't mean that he preferred Vogue to Cosmo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that for a lot of folks echoed the old anti-Semitic thing of, you know, rootless cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. um, well, and that was the fact Jim brought up the, the huddled masses and really got into it with them uh, about what does the Statue of Liberty stand for? And then they, they had a whole spat back and forth for a couple of minutes. And well, I mean, you know, that's another dog whistle, right? I mean, you're going to use these code words that you isolate your, your perceived enemy and I mean, they're masters at it. Stephen Miller, I mean, that guy, that he's risen as high as he has is astounding to me. I mean, he, at the Trump rallies during the campaign, he was sort of the opening act, and he would come out just spitting and hissing and saying the worst possible things about Hillary Clinton. It was sort of his job was to be the attack dog before Trump came, because Trump was so calm and mellow. Uh, and look at him now. He's, you know, a senior advisor, and maybe he's going to be a communications director. But these are the people running our country. That's well, the problem, I think, with this whole thing, is that 
we have normalized hate speech, although they will, they will tell you that it's not hate speech. We have normalized discrimination, when they'll tell you that they're not doing that. We've normalized all these things. I mean, this, this guy, uh, it just it astounds me. And I, 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 keep, I guess I say that too much, but it, it really does astound me that these are people, even a guy like Trump could, could get not just the nomination, but, but get elected. There are a lot of reasons for that, but I think Miller, if he becomes the communications director, I mean, his whole, if anybody has not seen his, his interaction with Jim Acosta, I mean, mm-hmm. Jim basically said, you know, my grandparents, when they came over, right. they didn't speak English. They wouldn't be able to get in to this country. And he went off on a tangent, accused him of all kinds of bias. I can't believe that you would even say, take that kind of, I mean, it's, it's just, it was almost to me full outrage, but, but knowing him, it may have been, may have been real. Well, he was mocking him and saying, so by the Acosta standard, how many people was it? Uh, you know, he, he created things that weren't, he wasn't saying. But at the end of the day, the, the Trump White House said, exactly, that's what we had in mind. Right. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the standard we have right now. Mm-hmm. Well, one area that they could be getting into that's not going to be open to spin is going to be Robert Mueller, right? Mm-hmm. And we've learned that Robert Mueller apparently has two grand juries and one in There was the existing one, and then he's using another one. Yeah, Um, looking into the Russia matter. Um, Bob, is there anyone in the White House who shouldn't have a lawyer on speed dial? (laughs) Well, the answer is no. But the irony is is that when the president's lawyer met with the White House staff, he told them, oh, you don't need a lawyer. You'll be fine. Um, It it really is um, astounding, again. (laughs) the, the second grand jury, by the way, was not a new grand jury. Right. It was the current grand jury right. in D.C. Right. But people are saying, why does he need two grand juries? And, you know, you have you know, that, that bastion of equanimity, uh, Alan Dershowitz, who basically accused him of racism for having this ju- jury in D.C., which is mostly black. So well, black the other people don't there. like Trump, so they're going to they're, they're gonna indict him because well, they can indict him. They can indict a ham sandwich anyway. So, <laughs> But the, the thing, why would you have it in D.C.? Well, if you believe crimes are committed, you have to have a grand jury in the jurisdiction in which those crimes were committed. Oh, really? And if I was in the White House, I'd be scared, you know, because that means that they found crimes being committed in D.C. in the White House, and that's why they're investigating it there. Um, also, uh, yeah, well, the grand jury thing, those, the grand juries have been going on for a while. It's just being reported now. It took a while for people yeah. to find out they were there. I mean, I heard weeks ago that some indictments had already been sealed. I don't know if that's true or not. But that the certainly subpoenas had been issued, and the grand juries were were hearing, you know, hearing a lot of potential evidence and testimony. So I think it's just taking time for the reporting to catch up. And Mueller runs a pretty tight ship. No one could possibly, other than President Trump, could ever accuse Robert Mueller of being anything other than a straight shooter. He was the U.S. attorney here in San Francisco for a long time. We worked, we dealt with you know, him, we yeah. covered him a lot. I mean, this guy, he he's not political. He doesn't have access to grind. He's gonna, if if he finds evidence, he's gonna indict people, and if he doesn't, he won't. Uh, the question will be, how far does it go? Sean Spicer is one person I was thinking of. He probably hasn't done anything that he has to worry about criminally. The rest of them, I, I wouldn't be so sure. What about that terrible suit? I mean, that was... <laughs> as far as I know, that's not a crime. So I think well, Mar- Maureen Dowd uh, is the issues. first person that I know of who has, has said that the FBI name for Robert Mueller was Bobby Three Sticks. Did you see that? Because he's Robert oh. Mueller the third. The third, yeah, Bobby, Bobby Three, three Sticks. Three sticks. But again, going back to this aide from Senator Feinstein, what he said was there were enough people in Washington who were still there during the impeachment of Bill Clinton. And he said, you will, what the Trump people said, you don't need a lawyer. That's nuts. You need a lawyer right now. And he said, you never want to have a closed door conversation. You keep every door open. You make sure you document everything now. From here on out, you do that. And it becomes a real strain on everyone. And I, and I think we're not seeing it because we're not involved. But in that area, it's, it's a very serious and very concerning moment. And, you know, it's going on in a big way. I remember someone from the Clinton administration telling a, a journalist that uh, she got to the point where she would not mention like a new intern's name before we, you know, what later happened. But she wouldn't even mention like a new young employee or an intern's name to the investigators because they would immediately then be called in and, and investigated. It, it kind of consumes mm-hmm. uh, the Everything. white. And I guess what the Clinton administration did was kind of set up an office to deal with it, silo it, try to yep. you know silo, silo it and such. But uh, 
now we're seeing more folks kind of writing and speaking and saying, you know, the problem is not even just the Russia thing, it's that, like with the Whitewater investigation, it's all the different branches they can mm -hmm. take it to. And go anywhere. Who would have thought Whitewater would have ended up with a, an impeachment for lying about a sexual offense? And mm -hmm. it was, well, it seems like there's a lot. Bob? There's a lot. It seems like there's, there's a lot there. I mean, yeah. um, if you don't watch any cable news, you know, um, you've seen all the different threads, even during the campaign, all the things, the, the allegations against, against the president before he became their president with his business dealings and how, mm -hmm. he, how, he, how he conducted business. I mean, not, the, the people he stiffed is one thing, but I mean, all the other things that went on that are questionable, I mean, this, the foundation, you know, I mean, the, the Boy Scout, the Boy Scout thing, uh, where he's accused of using uh, charitable found, char charitable donations to pay Do Donnie's Boy Scout registration. I mean, things that you aren't supposed to do. There's a whole lot of that that's gone on, and I think before now it was like, who cares? But now you're the president, um, and people care about everything you do, everything you've ever done. I mean. The Republicans spend all this time on Bill Clinton, on Whitewater and everything else. What do they get him for? Keep it clean. Getting, getting serviced in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the White House. And that was it. Yeah. And that was not what they were looking for. But you can only imagine with all the stuff that's happened with not just Trump, but all of his people around him, you know, Jared and Donnie and everybody else, that there's got to be, I mean, Michael Flynn, we, right now we already know he's... In, has a felony for not reporting his conversations over there with the Russian. That's, man, you can just imagine how much they may have. Um, mm -hmm. We had a Republican congressman who was on, I think, the Intelligence Committee who said he'd be shocked if nobody, nobody goes to jail, if someone doesn't go to jail for what they've already seen. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Jr. was a Boy Scout? Apparently so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> someone in the audience notes that doesn't uh, Trump's lawyer have his own lawyer? So. Yep. Yes. That's right. He does. That's yeah. right. Um, he's lawyered up. Okay. Someone yeah, in the audience. You need a lawyer now just for bringing that up. Yes. Well, <laughs> we'll debrief everyone in an in interrogation room after this. Uh, someone else in the audience needs a hug. They're saying, can each of you tell us a, an inside story we might not have heard that would give us hope regarding Trump and the GOP Congress? Nope. Does no. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> an insider that would give you hope about Trump and the GOP Congress? Boy. Uh, does that I, mean someone telling us that, yo, yes, they will be impeached? Or so, I mean, boy, you know, most of the inside people I talk to are Democrats, first of all. Uh, the deep state, you mean? Yeah, yeah, most of my deep state, I went to deep state tech, by the way, I don't know that. <laughs> I'm going to get a shirt and a sweatshirt. No, um, I got a master's gosh, I, deep state tech. That'll give you hope. Um, well, he no. hasn't accomplished anything. <laughs> he hasn't accomplished anything. And, uh, you know, Previously, when the Democrats were in charge, the Republicans were able to be obstructionists a little bit, and um, there had to be part of Nancy Pelosi and some of those people that said, "Now we'd like to we'd like to do it our way." And I think they've they've held everything up. Um, I don't know if you watched the circus; it was a terrific political show. Anybody watch that? Uh, they said on there, you know, Donald Trump is a battleship. Washington is the ocean. And that's mm -hmm. proved to be the case. It's not as easy as he thought, including health care. Well, who knew it was so complicated? Well, that was exactly. a, that was a uh, surprise you know, to all of us. Well, I, I mean, right? when you say hope, I mean, uh, I mean, I've talked to Pelosi about this, and she, she, uh, she downplays the impeachment stuff. She's like, don't even waste your time thinking about it. It's going to take too long. This investigation is going to be next year before we see indictments. Impeachment, you know, until we, we need so many Republicans to be willing to even bring it up or there isn't anything to do. Her focus is just winning the midterms in 2018. She's like, we, we're, our focus is going to be honing our message and taking back the House, and that's what we're going to focus on, and, and then we'll take it from there. And, and she is resigned uh, to Trump being there for four years. Yeah, that's, that is really, if you're At a Democrat. At least publicly. Yeah, that's your, if you're a Democrat, that is what you hope, that you have a, there are enough people out there that are really tired of what they're seeing and will go out and vote to take back the House. But even if you do impeachment, if you don't have the Senate, it doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I, and if you're a Republican, you hope that these scandals and these tweets stop, and you can kind of consolidate your, consolidate your power, and and basically continue doing what you're doing. What, no, 
start doing things you say you want to do, like tax, like the tax cuts and things like that. Because the way things are right now, that you know, Trump accused the Democrats of being obstructionists. Well, you can be obstructionist only so much when you don't have the majorities in the House and the Senate. A lot of reason why things aren't getting done is because the ideas he have he has are poor. Um, even Republicans are pushing back against the things he wants, which is why they couldn't get health care. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that if you want some hope, it's the fact that the Republicans at some point become more patriots than Republicans. Mm-hmm. That's the hope you have to have. Yeah, until they decide it's in their interest to get rid of him, we're stuck with him. I mean, that's what you have to hope. We, we've got a couple questions that kind of, that serves as a lead into, and, and they're questions about uh, Paul Ryan's hopes for tax reform and, and what they might try to get through. We talked about pivoting from health care, which w- did not turn out to be a winner for them, to tax reform. Uh, tax reform is no easier than health care. Yeah. And without the health care piece, it's very difficult to enact the kind of tax reform they're talking about. I mean, they admitted that's why they did health care first, because uh, it was sort of the linchpin to their tax reform. I'd be really surprised if they get tax reform through either. You don't have... I mean, the Republican Party is splintered on health care because you have both moderate senators who don't want to get rid of Medicaid and some of the other things they're trying to do, and then you have senators from um, Republican-governed states where the, where the Medicaid expansion has proven popular, so they don't want to do it. Uh, so there's more disparate views on health care than tax reform. I think they're a little more monolithic on tax reform, but I still think it's going to be very, very difficult for them to get it through. I'd be surprised if they get any of these things through, really. Maybe infrastructure. If he'd been smart, he would have started with infrastructure. Yeah. Because the Democrats... Didn't yeah. everybody been, say that? Yeah, that's, because that's, the Democrats that's, that's such a would have said, great, do. infrastructure, spending, jobs, economic stimulus. And they could have crafted something that everyone would have gone along with. It would have given Trump a win, but the Democrats would have been okay with some of it. And then they would have had some momentum. But by starting with the most contentious thing, I think he's really stalled his entire agenda. And the irony is, I recall, Obama submitted how many bills for infrastructure that were shot down by the Republicans? Mm-hmm. They had the one big one initially that they got through, and then that was it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, your, the tax cuts, when the latest tax plan was introduced and people found out that, you know, if you're making this much money, you get this much of a tax break. Mm-hmm. If you make this much money, you get this much of a tax break. I mean, even his, his supporters, just like on health care, when they said, well, wait a minute, this, I hated this stuff when I was at these town hall meetings as a member of the Tea Party, but now that I got this health care, I don't want to lose it. Mm-hmm. So don't take my health care away. And even though you, they were accused, these people are being accused of being Democrats, a lot of those were Republicans in there uh, with the outcry. So 200 days ago, it was the end of the world as we know it because <laughs> Donald Trump is president. And it's, I think it's time for a reset, which is, to start with, he's ineffective. He hasn't, he hasn't gotten anything through. He's tried to bully people. They're not having it. He did get Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. Right. He did get Gorsuch. That's correct. That's correct. But how sweet was it for John McCain to stand there on the, on the mm-hmm. Senate floor and go like that? No. After you called him a loser and after, after he spent five years in a prison camp? I mean, there are consequences to what we do. And the consequences of what he's done is he's becoming more and more irrelevant. All right. So let's, let's put that over there. Now we have a divided Republican Party, and we have an incredibly divisive political system that, ha- that pits these two parties against each other. At this point, can they now see that they're going to have to legislate and, and that there has to be some middle ground? And if that happens, who knows? It could be a good thing. I mean, it doesn't look great now, but <laughs> the economy's doing well. We're certainly engaged. There's no question about that. I don't think we... I don't think we're nearly as afraid of what Donald Trump is going to do as we used to be because he seems ineffective, distracted. I'd like to know where this vacation thing came from. I have a feeling it had to say, like, you need to settle down. Maybe you should go play golf. But as he tweeted, it was a long planned vacation. Oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah, oh, yeah. Exactly. The White House needed some paint. So, where do you Long planned exactly. renovation. Because it was a dump. It's right? a dump, yeah. that's right. <laughs> so, where do we go from here? And it, you know, is it. Is it possible? Crazy optimism? Maybe there's a shining path that, that shows that we could get some of this done. But we, we are really stuck now. And if there's ever a time, it's crisis that makes these, these kind of things happen. It, it just may be a good thing. Not a good thing. And that's when Trump right. decides, hmm, maybe we should attack North Korea. Right. Well, that's the one thing that hasn't happened is, an, is a national crisis. Right. 
you know, and God knows what would happen if, if we did have one. But that is the one thing, and we talked about this before here, that every presidency has that one moment mm-hmm. that defines the presidency. And, you know, for someone like George Bush, who came with a million ideas and he ends up weapons of mass destruction, turns out to be the definition of his pregnancy. We don't know. Not pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Presidency. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, I was just going to say, talking about that idea of, you know, an international crisis of our or some other uh, actors making, um, did you catch that tidbit that was in the news? Uh, now Chief of Staff John Kelly, previously Homeland Security. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yes. No, uh, I know where you're he, going. Yeah, he and... Uh, Defense Secretary James Mattis apparently made a pact between themselves that one of them always would remain in the United States just to deal with whatever might come up. Mm -hmm. Um, Not only that, that you have members of the Senate who are always going to remain in Washington so they don't go into recess to Mm -hmm. prevent a recess appointment. Right. Yeah, Mattis and Kelly apparently uh, they agreed, look, there's chaos, there's, we need to have at least one adult here at all times to actually run things because the people in the White House can't. And uh, the fact that that got out is very interesting yeah. because yeah. they apparently made it many months ago before Kelly was chief of staff. He was Homeland Security Secretary. Uh, that, that got out, I mean, it really undermines Trump and the, and the White House now. I wonder, uh, who knows where it came from. It would be great if John Kelly leaked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody's leaking like crazy because that transcript of those phone calls incredible. Yeah. was incredible. Yeah. I don't know if you saw Andy it, Morowitz in the, in the New Yorker, but he said after those two phone calls, then Trump got another phone call from, from uh, Mueller who said, I cannot believe how innocent you are. You're unbelievably <laughs> innocent. In fact, in terms of presidents, I think you're the most innocent president I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. He just called the other day and told me that. So Yeah, the, and again, if people don't know, uh, the, these were transcripts of when he became president, he had phone calls with many world leaders, and the ones of his conversations with the president of Australia, or prime minister of Australia, and... Um, Mexico. Uh, Mexico. Mexico, yeah. yes, thank you. Bill were Bill. From January, or late January, came out just the other day. <laughs> They're pretty astounding. Well, we actually had heard about the conversations before, but we hadn't seen the transcripts. And the White House said there was nothing to them. The White House exactly. version was very different from what right. the actual transcripts yeah. show. Maybe we'll eventually see the transcripts of his call from the Boy Scouts chief and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my old pals from Deep State Tech yeah. is the one who leaked yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are people in the White House. Someone is, I mean, with access to incredible information is, is getting it out there. And I'll bet you any amount of money it is not an Obama holdover. Because that's the narrative. These are all Obama right. holdovers. He right. clean, the, drain the swamp, you know, get rid of all the Obama people. It's his own people doing this. Yeah. People that are on his, his, on the White House staff. I mean, there's a, a great Twitter account called Senior White House Advisor. I don't know who this is, mm-hmm. but you know, there's some, some stuff on that on Twitter that just like kind of hair raising. Search that one. I was on a call a few months back, a conference call with a White House conference call where, right after they'd said all, after he said all the stuff about anonymous sources, don't use anonymous where I asked a question and, and they said, well, we can't talk about that. I was like, can I use it on background? They said, okay, you can say senior administration official. I'm like, wait, he just this morning said, oh, they all keep saying senior administration officials. They make that stuff up. Yeah. I mean, their own people do exactly what it is that he's criticizing. Speaking of Twitter, uh, this morning, Donald Trump, or today, Donald Trump tweeted, quote, how much longer will a failing New York Times with its big losses and massive unfunded liability yeah. and non-existent sources remain in business, unquote, to which California Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom responded, Donald J. Trump, you're the expert on bankruptcy. You tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on. So uh, we want... It's only been there 170 years, so yes. it's probably about due to fail, right? Uh, we want to get through a few other uh, items quickly before we get to the news quiz, one of which is Jeff Sessions, the U.S. Attorney General. He has a lot on his plate. We've already touched on some of it. Uh, Sanctuary cities, uh, affirmative action at universities. Um, uh, What are some of the other things? Uh, Rooting out leakers, of course. Crackdown on marijuana. um, And working on his LinkedIn profile. Uh, Bob, what do you think of his (laughs) profiles? I mean... Uh, excuse me, his, his uh, priority. I mean, he's, he's got <laughs> a lot to... Too. Well, I think his priorities are very consistent with Trump supporters. You know, they don't want universities to use race in admissions. You know, they, they go, this goes all the way back to Alan Bakke back in the mm-hmm. late 70s when he said, you know, this university has 100 slots for admission, and because of you know, past policies of the past, they set, by, by, set aside 15 slots for minorities. 
you know, so I had to be in the top 85. I was number 86. Mm -hmm. So th I'm, that's discrimination because I didn't get in. You know, it's reverse. To say it's reverse discrimination admits the discrimination in the first place. So I don't feel very kindly to what he's trying to do when it comes to admissions for universities. Um, there's not much he's doing that I feel kindly towards, mm -hmm. but I just think I think it's a very you know mean spirited um, attempt to take this country back. Their idea of making America great again is not the same as my idea of making America great. Mm -hmm. I think America is already great, but the things that they're trying to do, you. Let's talk about voting rights. You know, I saw a great screed, I call it a screed, uh, for one of my conservative friends who talked about this new report that's out in Judicial Watch mm. that says that there are more registered voters in California than there are residents because they're including the people that have died that may still be on the voter rolls. Just because you have more registered voters you don't, doesn't mean they all vote. And that's what I think the thing is. And Judicial Watch is, to me, is a, it's a right-wing rag and... I'm not going to apologize for saying that. They, they, they publish a lot of fake news stuff, stuff that I've actually busted them on. Uh, not busted them, but busted the people that, that post their mm -hmm. stuff. And I'll go ahead and post the link. Uh, I'll, I'll post the Snopes correction. Um, well, now they've, Snopes is now, it's a left-wing um, mm -hmm. website that has no credibility. Okay. The, 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 the best one is the Islamic woman who was trying to blow up a pipeline in New Mexico, who was arrested sometime last year. And they said, we haven't covered that story. Um, so I've, I went and saw like five or six different websites that posted the same story, quoting the Judicial Watch. So being the reporter, I called the Sheriff's Department and they laughed at me. Man, this, this never happened. We got all these calls. This never happened. And I told them that. They still don't believe it. On Sessions, I would just say, you know, we, we talk about dog whistles and playing to the base, but a lot of this stuff is just what they truly believe. I mean, Sessions is going to do, and Trump too, uh, the things they want done and have always wanted done and weren't in power to do. Jeff Sessions, I mean, look at his record and, and his background. He, they don't want sanctuary cities. They don't want immigrants here. They don't want minorities to get preference to universities. And they hold the levers of power now, so they're going to do anything they can to uh, implement the, the goals they've had all along and weren't able to. I mean, the, some of this stuff is just their true belief, and you have to take it for that and not necessarily political, but ideological. Chuck, there was a survey recently uh, in which a majority of Republicans said that colleges were actually bad for the country. Yeah. So why even bother trying to get in? Well, it, it wasn't great for me, I'll tell you. I, <laughs> I would just say about Jeff Sessions, if there's ever anyone who should be named Beauregard, it should be yeah. him. He's, yeah. the, he's the perfect choice for that. Mm -hmm. He thought he was getting fired. I mean, he thought he was getting yeah. fired. Mm -hmm. And it took Lindsey Graham saying there's going to be hell to pay. It took all those people to stand up to say, no, you're not getting fired. Okay, now I saved my job. Now I have to do what the boss says. And throwing these things out here, again, they're, they're fine to throw out as a talking point, as a dog whistle, but they don't have any legs. We've talked about affirmative action for years and years and years. It is a very difficult issue, but it has been very well discussed. This isn't the first time anyone's brought this up. This immigration policy, we know that people are depending on immigrants to keep their, to keep their, work, their workplace going. Mm -hmm. That's not... That, that's not news, but we're going to throw these things out. That's what he wants to do. And he's counting on the fact that other people in the United States will, will be equally angry. And I, I think at some point we're going to stop being angry and start moving forward. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about Colin Kaepernick. Oh, no. Mm, yes, Come on. Yes. Here in the Bay Area, of course, we are used oh. to people taking political stands. Our supervisors do it. Our Uber driver does it. Our buses <laughs> used to do it. You remember that? Um, but when the 49ers quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, uh, as you recall, knelt instead of standing during uh, the national anthem, he got a lot of blowback. And Bob, you've been looking into this. I mean, what are your thoughts on his current inability to find a team to play for? Well, he's been, he's been blackballed by the NBA, I mean, the, NBA, the NFL. Oh, the NBA. Uh, yeah, NBA is not hiring him either. Which, which is an ironic, you know, blackball, the black player being blackballed. But, but seriously, I understand what he was doing. I mean, this is at a time when you've had all these young black men killed by police, yeah. unarmed. Um, many of them may have been committing some kind of a crime or suspected of committing some kind of a crime. But um, Philando Castile was not committing any crime. Mm -hmm. He was pulled over for a broken taillight um, and told the officer he had a gun and was shot and killed. 
and the officer just got off, just got, got acquitted. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that Kaepernick was trying to point out. And I understand his position. Um, the NFL um, is being more than hypocritical by not even offering, he's not even getting interviews. Nobody's even talking to him. Um, it's okay to, if, you, if you are accused of killing somebody. It's okay if you're accused of beating up your wife. It's okay if you run a dog fighting ring. It's okay if you, you have an accident and you're drunk. All these things are okay. It's okay if you abuse drugs. You'll do a, a three-game suspension and you come back. But to stand up for your rights, rights which, by the way, many in the military say, I fought for his right to be able to do that. I mean, I agree with him, but he has the right to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the height of hypocrisy, and you know, you'll get me angry if I keep talking about it. Let me just say, you, you, I don't think he would be blackballed by the NBA. The NBA has a lot of outspoken black athletes, and they don't suffer for it. But I really think what this is about, I mean, initially I thought, God, knowing the NFL and its culture of winning, and that's all they care about, winning and making money, I found it hard to believe that someone, a coach who, who thought Kaepernick was good enough wouldn't be able to sign him. But the NFL has a very different fan base from the NBA, and the NFL has this NASCAR audience, and, and it's a very different fan base across the country, and they're shying away from a guy who, granted his career kind of went south, but as a Green Bay Packer fan who had to watch him destroy my team in the playoffs a couple of times and did not enjoy it, um, the guy ran ragged against us. And uh, I think with the right coach, he could still be a really good quarterback. So I find it, it's amazing to me that someone won't take a chance on him. The Miami Dolphins just signed Jay Cutler, who is one of the yeah. most useless yeah. athletes I've ever seen in my life. And there's no way Kaepernick isn't better than he is. So I, I, you get to the point where I got to agree with Bob and think they're, they're just... Yeah. He's blacklisted. I was at San Jose State a couple of weeks ago at a, a forum um, on sports, and Dr. Harry Edwards, who you probably all know, said that if he's not signed in time for the NFL season, there's going to be problems, not for Kaepernick, but for the league. And already there are a couple of groups uh, planning to boycott the games in L.A. for the Rams and the Chargers, and I'm hearing that there may be other groups around the country planning to do the same thing because of this. Well, I'm going to disagree with both of you. But first I'm going to say... Uh, the NFL has employed a lot of people with much worse domestic abuse. I mean, a lot, yeah. it's, there's no way. Let's remember, Kaepernick did this for two games and nobody even noticed. Mm -hmm. When he did it, the 49ers said, fine. The, the ownership said, that's his right. Chip Kelly, the coach, said, go ahead. Other teammates joined him. Mm -hmm. This idea that this was some kind of a horrible upset in the team never happened, okay? He was then voted the Lena Ashmont Award right. for the most right. popular player, most which leads me to believe most inspirational, most inspirational player, yeah. which leads me to believe that the primary concern is he's not a very good quarterback, which is what I think. He's not a very good. He's not a starter because they would have picked him up. Starter has to start with the, with the first preseason games. His numbers on any level are below the top 20 in any quarterback. You're not trying to draft or sign the, the 25th best quarterback in the NFL. You're trying to sign a really good quarterback. Last year, he threw, we hear it all the time, 16 touchdowns, four interceptions. He also went one in 10. He threw for 300 yards once. He threw for fewer than 200 yards several times. He's I thought Kyle Shanahan said it very well. If you're going to have a quarterback like this, you're going to have to turn your whole offense over to him. Okay? He's going to be a running quarterback. Your offensive linemen are going to have to block differently. Your receivers are going to have to block him. We don't want to do that. Kaepernick was in the 49ers. He's, had a, he's 30 years old. He's had an opportunity. And these guys evaluate quarterbacks for a living. Now, at this point, if you're Miami, and Colin Kaepernick says, you know that Fidel Castro did a <laughs> lot of good things. You are not going to be popular in Miami. That is one city where I could see him not going. But where are these people? Where are these demonstrations? Don't you dare sign Colin Kaepernick. I don't see it. He's going to be a backup quarterback. You're going to sign him. There's going to be a huge kerfuffle. There's going to be a press conference. What happens if halfway through the season, his supporters say, why isn't he starting? Mm -hmm. I think he should be the starting quarterback. Is this racism? Is this because of his political views? What if you bring him into, into training camp? The 49ers have 100 people in, in training camp right now. They're going to cut that down to 45. Half the people aren't going to be there. What if you decide that your rookie quarterback that you drafted is better than you thought? And as a matter of fact, 
he's going to be a lot cheaper than Colin Kaepernick. So let's cut Colin Kaepernick and keep this guy. What's going to happen? It's going to be an uproar. Are we going to say that the commissioner of football has to demand that some team sign Colin Kaepernick or there's something wrong? And good luck with the demonstration. I mean, that's great. 31,000 people signed a petition. That's half of an NFL stadium. The NFL is millions and millions of people all over the United States. It's billions and billions of dollars. You know who got blackballed? Barry Bonds. Mm -hmm. Barry Bonds could still hit, but he was a pain in the butt. And they said, you know, we don't want to put up with that. And I think they're going to say, at the end of the day, if three games into the regular season, Colin Kaepernick isn't going to sign, what's, what are you going to do? What, what's, the, what's the response to that? So. One, one man's opinion, but I don't think, like I said, Kyle Shanahan is the quarterback whisperer. He's the man of the hour right now. And he looked at tapes of Colin Kaepernick with the 49ers and he said, he's not a good fit. And I think the rest of the league has thought the same thing. And now that his people are like sending out these tweets like Ray Lewis said that he should cut his hair. I don't know why he said that. Ray Lewis is nuts. I mean, we all know mm -hmm. Ray Lewis is nuts. But one of his supporters tweeted a picture, a Photoshop picture of Ray Lewis and Samuel L. Jackson from Django, meaning mm -hmm. you're, you're being a big Uncle Tom. Well, that's not helping the cause here. That's not helping the idea. I mean, he's already said, I'm not going to kneel for the national anthem this time. I'm ready to be a player. But if they don't sign him, what are you going to do? Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thanks to our panel, Bob Butler. I know, but, but uh, thanks to our panel, Bob Butler, Chuck Nevius, and Doug Sovereign. We'll be back Monday, August 21st, right here at the Commonwealth Club. And thanks to all of you. Have a great week. Everyone watching online, too.